Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for thy blessings, thy anointing. We thank you for the love that you share with each and every one of us, Father. Our cups truly do runneth over. We also have these unspoken prayers before you at this time, Father. You know every heart, every need, every wish, every dream, every concern. And we thank you for not only hearing these prayers, but we thank you for answering them in perfect season. Also, Father, we pray for June, Jody, Dana, Kim, Damon, Heather, Becca, the Owenbees, Regina, and Dan. On all these, Father, we ask that you lead, that you guide, that you direct, that you touch, and that you heal in Yeshua's precious holy name. And as always, Father, we pray for all those past and present that they have not forsaken thy word and that they will return to the sheepfold soon. And we pray for Israel and our nation knowing that thy kingdom will come, that it will be thy will that will be done on this earth as it is in heaven, to which we long for, and we say, come, Lord, come. And we pray for those first responders every day they are on the front lines helping your children, as well as our military who are in arms way or who are about to go into arms way. We pray that they will all be able to return home soon. <coughs> and we pray, dear Lord, always for the lost, those that do not have an opportunity this day to receive thy truth. Now, Father, I pray that you open up our ears, that we may hear our eyes, that we may see. For it is by thy hand, Father, that we are led. We love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strengths, and with all our souls. Father, please bless us this day with thy teaching. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, normally, uh, first of all, I'd like to wish everybody uh, a belated uh, Happy Christmas, knowing that uh, the true Christmas story, those of you that have ne never studied with us before, if you go to our archives and go to the very ending, I think it's some 200 um, videos uh, past the beginning, if you go to the beginning of our videos, you'll see uh, two different lectures. One is called uh, The True Christmas, uh, and it's a little play, a little skit that our church group put on a while back, I guess about six years ago now. And uh, the other one is um, right next to it, I think it's the first video, uh, where it talks about the true Christmas. And if you have not uh, studied that before, take the time to do so. I think uh, it, it would benefit you if you don't know it already. But also, this time of year, uh, this being 2019, I want to uh, ask uh, for everyone's forgiveness a little bit for not being able to continue our lectures uh, over the holiday season. Uh, I was, some of you are aware, I was in the hospital. I had a uh, vein uh, leg transplant. No, bypass. Bypass, excuse me. That uh, went well. Uh, I'm recuperating, but I'm doing well, thank the Lord. Uh, mm -hmm. I was supposed to uh, miss quite a lot of time, but uh, the Lord saw fit to bring me back very quickly. So I, I appreciate that very much. But also, uh, this time of year, what I'd normally do is uh, do a uh, uh, next year being the, this 2019 prophecy. Each year I've tried to do a prophecies on each year. But after prayer, uh, the Lord basically said, uh, and I hate uh, putting words in the Lord's mouth, but it's like ditto. In other words, what we experienced this past year with the climate changes and the and the tsunamis and the earthquakes and the volcanoes and the floods and the rain and the snows and the terrible weather and and the destruction man against man is going to continue and unfortunately or fortunately depending on how you look at it it's going to get worse you say well why is that fortunate because the bible tells us 
that when these things occur, his coming is soon. But we do know that the Antichrist must come before Jesus Christ, which tells us it, 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 this world is going to turn everything over to him, lock, stock, and barrel, thinking that he's Jesus Christ, the Savior. And if you don't know and understand that, read and study Second Thessalonians chapter 2. It will tell you very clear, clearly, step by step, what's going to occur before Jesus Christ returns. So, um, I, I, I don't want to make trivia of those terrible things. You say, well, how, how can that be a good thing? Well, it's a good thing knowing that the Lord's coming soon. It's a good thing knowing that the Lord has prepared us for these things. Uh, those that are um, those that are hurting and suffering and will will go through terrible uh, tribulations and all that. Um, it will give God's children an opportunity to help other people, to be there for them, to help them. And this is also what we're studying in Second Corinthians. So. With that being said, let us get back into the Word of God, and we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 with verse 1, with wisdom from our Heavenly Father, and it reads, and Paul says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now, we know that... Uh, Paul was a scholar, a Bible scholar. We also know that he was well educated. But uh, sometimes he uh, uses what I call legalese to uh, uh, bring forth the Gospels. I would like to place this first verse in a little bit more easier to understand language. Same, it's, it's the same information, just uh, spoken a little differently. It says, moreover, brethren, we inform you of the grace God, about the grace God has given on the churches of Macedonia. So Paul's basically saying, look, this is what we do. We, we tell you, we, we give you like testimonies of what has happened to us, what has ap happened to the other peoples of the house of God, the church of God, the Christian church, um, and we inform you of those good things that happen, and we inform you of those bad things that happen, so that you can be well informed about what it is like to walk with the Lord and what it is like to not walk with the Lord. Verse 2. How that in a great trial of affliction, in other words, much trouble, the abundance of their joy in, 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 in uh, uh, Macedonia and other churches as well, even in Corinth, of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. In other words... We want you to understand that it, having money, don't having money has nothing to do with this. That it has to do with, it doesn't matter how poor you are, it doesn't matter how much in need you are of, of the things of this world, that you can abound in great riches. Well, what are those great riches? Well, knowing and accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior is the greatest rich that you can possess and that that it has been bestowed upon you freely now not that a price wasn't paid the price was paid by Christ himself on the cross for your sins and my sins but the not just the knowing of Jesus Christ but the abounding of of the abundance of of this uh, this uh, great riches of I mean, think of it this way. We, we're talking about uh, the destruction and, and the end times of how people are behaving today. Um, 
what is wrong seems right and what is right seems wrong. And you got all these people just fighting against one another. And, and there are even politicians who are uh, on both sides who are, are expediating, uh, telling people to do certain things and behave certain ways. That is a negative behavior. Division and hatred. Division and hatred. Thank you. And, and this is being caused not by God, but this is being caused by the ruler or the prince of the air, which is Satan himself. And people say, well, I'm not following Satan. Well, you are following Satan if you're not doing what's right. If you're constantly battling. And, and I'm not saying fighting for what's right. I'm, I'm talking about just having hate on your heart and distrust and, 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 and all the negative attributes that comes from the Antichrist. Our Father wants us to live in this world, and he knows that this world is in terrible shape, and it's going to continue until his return. However, we can rise above that in our thoughts and in our actions by being a person, not a walking mat, but being a person that, that God can use to further his ministry, to further his love and his commitment to his children. How many people today need the Lord Jesus Christ? How many people today need love in their hearts? Now, now, here comes the little old Christian, and a lot of times they will be uh, browbeaten, meaning mentally uh, uh, threatened by this world, and and even challenged by some family members by by following the Gospels. But who are you here to please? Your father or them? So. Uh, the great riches, you have a liberality in life. You, you can do what you need to do when you need to do it because God is on your side. And beloved, that is the greatest richness that you can possess on this planet. Verse 3, for to their power, I bear record. Paul saying, look, I, I've seen this power. This power comes from Christ, the, the Holy Spirit within them, but it gives them great riches. It gives them great liberality. It gives them great freedom. And it doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor. Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. In other words, they gave of their own accord. It even... Uh, can go back to uh, in Mark chapter 12 verse 44 it talks about the widow's might remember that parable and and that truth where where the uh, the widow came to the temple and she gave uh, a half a pent or half a half a penny uh, and it was all that she had now granted there's some preachers today saying look this is what this is what you need to do you need to give all that you have to the church well, they completely miss the point. It has nothing to do with giving all that you have. It's talking about giving from your heart. And this is what the Lord has always wanted. And in other words, and it's not always money. Giving of the heart means you, that you truly want to help someone. You want to be there for someone somewhere at some time. And this is what it means to be a Christian. And this is what this world sorely needs. Not just at Christmas time. You, you hear of all these things at Christmas time where, where people are, are paying off people's uh, uh, debt at uh, uh, layaways. And you, you hear, uh, I heard this guy, he, every year uh, he takes out $10,000 and he gives out $100 bills to people. And I'm not to take away from what people are uh, given to give, but... It's also all those people that are taking their time and their their effort to help people, putting packages together and, and helping others. But guess what? In a Christian's life, this should happen year round, not just at, at times of floods or hurricanes or at Christmas time. This should be on your heart to be able to do all the time. Some people say, well, I don't have the funds to do that. I can understand that, but it doesn't always take money. You know, I can remember years ago that um, we were at um, a church in the earliest part of my ministry. I think I was a music minister back then. 
and um, there was a guy, uh, it was a flea market ministry, and there was a guy that came in, and he was sitting there, and after after church, he still sat there, and, and the uh, pastor at that time asked him, you know, who he was, and if he needed anything, and basically he told him uh, the... Um, the parable of, of, of foxes have holes and, 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 and that sort of thing. Basically, long story short, is that we found out that he was homeless. And the pastor goes, well, we'll, we'll pray for you. And, and um, that was it. Everybody went their way. But that night, uh, I couldn't get that man out of my mind. As a matter of fact, I didn't sleep all night long. And it was placed on my heart to go find that man. That very next day, that was a, a, a severe priority in my life. And he was, he had been sleeping under a bridge, and he was, uh, turns out he was, just got him a job at the, at the uh, ice service store right next to the flea market. So we were able to contact him. Long story short, we were able to help him uh, find residence. We were help him to go back and forth to work, uh, and basically help him to, get another leg up to to uh, bring himself up out of that severe poverty that he was in. It was a hand up, not a hand out. Say that again? It was a hand up, not a hand, hand out. Hand up, not a hand out. And um, eventually he got into his own ministry where he was helping uh, women of the night, so to speak, uh, and helping women that were walking the street, his heart went out to them to, to try to get them out of prostitution and that sort of thing. So that was his ministry. Point being with all this, I'm not trying to puff myself up. Point being is, what did that take on my part? All it took was a very little amount of time, uh, very little amount of money. All it took on my part was gas money a little bit and not much at all but the point is is it was there to help someone and this is what our father wants us to do now have I done that since we've helped many other people we've helped children we've helped elderly we've done all kinds of things but the point is our father wants you to help someone somewhere at some time Christ has told us you will always have the poor and that doesn't necessarily always mean the poor financially, but that also means the poor in spirit. So keep that in mind day to day in your life. There's always someone near you that can use your helping hand. Verse 4. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift, that's of the Holy Spirit, and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, those set aside. In other words, they prayed for our ministry. They prayed for God's word to continue. And that's powerful, beloved. When, when you, it, it seems like in a Christian's life, especially a milk Christian or a new Christian, they're praying a lot for themselves. You know, Lord, I need this. Lord, I want this. Lord, I, you know, give me this and that and the other. As you mature as a Christian, and as you grow in, in the power of God within you, you realize that now those prayers are going outward. In other words, you're praying for ministries. You're praying for other peoples. You're praying for maybe knowledge to be able to help someone along the way. So it's not directed towards self anymore. It's directed outward. Verse 5, and this they did, not as we hoped. In other words, they did more than what we hoped. But first gave their own selves to the Lord. That was step one. And that's step one for everybody. You must give yourself to the Lord. What does it mean to give yourself to the Lord? It's an easy statement to read. But what, what does it really mean to give yourself to the Lord? You're basically putting him first in everything you do. Your thoughts, your decisions, your work. You give glory and honor to him rather than taking the praise for yourself when you're doing things. Just like every morning when, when uh, my wife Donna feeds me. You should call her Pastor Donna because she is a pastor. 
and she she cooks me breakfast and I thank her and her very next words always is thank the Lord of course I've thanked the Lord already and she knows that but she puts the Lord first by making that statement you know she knows that I thank the Lord she knows that she's thanked the Lord I'm giving him honor but Lord. she's giving him honor she doesn't want that praise to herself and it's not that people don't want to hear thank you but the thing is when 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 we're doing good things, when we're doing good deeds, when we're helping someone, when we're serving someone, we should always give praise to God. Now some people say, well, why, why should I give praise to God when it's me doing it? Your father is the one that gave you the opportunity exactly. to do it. That's it. You know, because without, without the Lord, A, I wouldn't be here. B, I wouldn't have the ability to be doing. C, I wouldn't have the materials to be doing with the electricity, the stove, the food, you know, and goes on from there. Yes, yes it does. But first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. First giving to God, then they gave to us. Gave thanks to God for an opportunity to help us. And, and let's not forget they were in great poverty. So they're not given a bunch of money, although they did tithe to them, to the church. But their prayers went a long way in helping. Verse 6, Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, as he had started the ministry and working with them, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Just as he began. It's just like well, Paul wants us to understand what our Lord wants us to understand through Paul's teachings here. When you first became a Christian, you were excited. You were exuberant. It was, it was new to you. It was fresh to you. And, and, and all things were new to you. And, and you, you did, uh, God did marvelous works through you. Well, guess what? He still wants to do that for you. He doesn't want you to become complacent. The flesh seems to always want more and more and more and more and more. It's never satisfied. As a Christian, you learn to be satisfied with what you have, but that doesn't mean that you don't want more of it. It's just like best example of, of when I pray at times, thanking my father about, the ministry that he has given me and allowed me even to be here on YouTube and the amount of peoples that are watching, it's never enough. You know, I always want more. Why? To, to build my ego? No. I want more to be able to study the Word of God, to, to have an opportunity to receive the fullness of the truth. There's, and I'm not saying they can't find it other, other places, but there's so many places today that I see. This is why I've been called to do this. There's so many places today that I see that are misleading God's children. They're misteaching them with false doctrine. And it's, it's shameful. It's really shameful. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I have all the answers, but I know where all the answers lie. And, and I'll, I'll tell you this, which I've told you uh, before, I would rather die than teach anything falsely. Does that mean I've never made a mistake? I've made mistakes in my um, understanding of certain things, but never in misquoting. Now, what do you what do you mean uh, misunderstanding? Well, I, I I may have years ago I used to believe in Easter. I used to I used to go out in my yard and take my guitar and 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 sing I'll fly away and 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 be there when the sun's coming up well I was on even though I read it I was unaware of how my father felt about it until he revealed it to me in his word that to him looking at the sun on Easter was an abomination to him now that may offend some of you but read it for yourself. Study the Word of God. Forget about what you have learned by man. Study what our Father has said in His 
word. He wants us to follow Passover. He doesn't want us to be out there singing, I'll fly away, when he's coming here. Why do we want to fly away when he's returning here to be with us? Oh, you don't understand First Thessalonians. I understand First Thessalonians better than I've ever understood it. It's to meet the Lord with the breath of life. That's where that word pneuma comes from, air. Not, 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 not up in the stratosphere. But it's a different subject for a different time. But there's certain things that I, I followed, thinking I was doing what was right, and I was mistaught. And it wasn't until I opened up these pages for myself, and I prayed to the creator of these pages, and asked him to lead, guide, and direct me. And he did. First he brought me to a, a marvelous teacher in Dr. Arnold Murray, and I studied with him for years. And he led me to study all kinds of different Bibles from cover to cover, read them over and over and over again, to which I did. And he taught me right from wrong. He taught me the true way of studying, the true way of honoring, and the true way of worshiping him. And then all those things that I had been mistaught, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, at first I got ticked off. I really did. I got upset by that false doctrine that I had followed. And at first I got upset for those that taught me that false doctrine. But you know what? It was their ignorance. To which I could honestly say today, I've forgiven every one of them, and I could honestly say, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. But they too have an opportunity of changing. And, and the light, I remember as if it happened yesterday, the light that turned instantly one day, I was talking to my former teacher, my, my, my teacher on, the, on this planet, and I was explaining to him about the, uh, the, the uh, flyaway doctrine, how false it was. And he basically looked at me and says, you mean to tell me that you're right and the world is wrong? Meaning his world was that, that, I won't name the faith, but what they taught. And I said, absolutely. It's not that I'm right, but God's word is right. And he never talked to me again. Which is unfortunate, because I wish I could talk to him. And, and continue to talk to him. And continue to bring him to the truth in God's word. But the point being with all this is that no matter where you're at with our Lord, in, in your knowledge and wisdom of, of what you think is knowledge and wisdom, whatever denominational setting you're in, Father will lead you to the truth if you truly want it. Yes. Isn't this verse basically saying that because Titus went through the trials and tribulations and the spiritual change and growth with the church in Macedonia, he was using his testimony to bring it to um, Corinth to help them? Sure. And that's what we all do. That's why I elaborated so heavily about what I went through, mm -hmm. is I was able to, even though I was doctrinated in theology, man's theology, not God's, in the church system, I was able to come out of that and use what I had known to bring, the once the fullness of the gospel came to me through Christ our Lord, I am now able to teach it correctly. And that's what Titus is doing. Mm -hmm. And Paul. Let's not forget Paul. Paul was Saul before he was Paul. And he, he hated the Christian church. He was the ones that held the coats to Stephen. You know, and the, the first uh, Christian martyr. And so Paul, even with all his knowledge and wisdom, got it wrong, see, until the trueness of Christ came through to him and he accepted the true teachings of our Lord Jesus yes, Christ. So this is basically saying your testimony is important in helping other people come to Christ. Your testimony is vitally important. Why? Because your testimony is a personal um, what's the word? A personal roadmap. <laughs> Well, yeah, roadmap, but it, it's something personally that's happened to you. 
that you can relate. I mean, you, you can read scripture verses and quote scripture verses till the cows come home to someone, and they may never understand the fullness of it, but if you use your personal testimony of how that verse affected your life and what it meant to you to come out of darkness into light, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. But you're utilizing still the same scripture verses. Mm -hmm. You're just doing it on a personal level now. That was personal to you and hopefully will be personal to them. Verse 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Don't forget the generous, unmerited favor that Christ bestowed upon you to bring you out of darkness. You need to share that with people whenever given an opportunity, because it's powerful. It's your own personal testimony. Eight, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, the, the, even the testimony of others. And now hear this, and to prove the sincerity of your love. How can you prove your sincerity of your love to other people? By doing something. Not being hearers only. I mean, we, we, we come together and we hear of all, all the things that we should do according to the Word of God, how we should behave, how we should think, how we should act. And those, yes, it's a learning tool. But you're not going to be able to fully grasp this until you go out and do something with it. Help somebody. It's becoming... Not selfish, but selfless. Yes, absolutely. In other words, you think of yourself less than you do another person. Being doers of the word mm -hmm. instead of hearers only. Now, this, like the example I gave you earlier, it may it, it may not take a dime. It may not take a dime out of your pocket, but it will take something. It's a it will take it will take your time to do something about it. It's a thought process. It's, it a is change, a it's a change of your thought process. It's when you when you go out, instead of trying to get one over on somebody else or to do unto others before they do unto you, you're thinking of their, well, example, at Home Depot the other day, and I'd gone and got a buggy, and I'm pushing it to go get my bird seed, and there's this couple, an, an older gentleman and woman, a little bit louder. And, and he's carrying an armful of, of things and he's having difficulty walking and she's oblivious she's looking at other stuff and I loudly said to him sir would you like this buggy and she turned around as if somebody had slapped her basically and she goes well yes that would be marvelous and he looked relieved and then I gave him the buggy and I went and got another one I mean it's just a small thing but it, it at that moment it was important you know but it, it, it wasn't a I didn't give it a second thought. It just it was natural. It was a thought process of thinking about somebody else's what they're going through rather than what I had to do at that moment. Kind of reminds me of a time we were coming out of this mainstream church. Oh, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in this church. And we're all coming out and they're filing out and I mean it, it, it took a long time to empty out the parking lot. Well I remember because it was so heavily uh, congested that it took us a while. We're just moving slowly in this line, and there was a, a woman parked on the street with uh, one or two kids. I can't remember how many kids she had, but she had a flat tire, and she was standing outside the car. And all these now they had just gotten out of church, and all these cars are looking at her and just passing her by, passing her by, <laughs> passing her by. Uh, and I'm thinking, why isn't anybody stopping? And, of course, we got up there, and we stopped, and we asked her if she needed any help, and she said no, that her husband was coming, he's on his way, and be there in a few minutes. But that's beside the point. I don't know how many, if not 100 or 200 people, passed her by without ever asking her. And they had just got out of church service. Now, now, that's what Donna's talking about, the mindset of people. 
There's people that need help. And 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 sometimes we gotta search that out, but let me tell you something. Almost every day you go outside the highways and byways, you can always find someone somewhere that needs some help of some sort somewhere at some time. It, it might be something so minuscule that normally it would pass your vision without noticing it. Just like the buggy. I mean it wasn't a big thing. It didn't cost me a thing other than walking. Yeah. You know. Verse 9, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Uh, another understanding of this, I want to go to one verse in Luke chapter 9, verse 58. Luke chapter 9, verse 58 says this. I talked about this earlier. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. In other words, they have, they've got a home. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. That's where that, that, that guy, uh, that homeless man, quoted from. And now, now what does it mean that, that Christ left um, uh, a place where he was rich? Well, what is the eternal kingdom? Where there's a want, where there's a need. No, uh, it, it, and, and when you're looking at rich, there there is no want, there is no need. But what did he become? He became a servant for all mankind, to the point that he gave up his very own life. He was a flesh man. He became flesh. The eternity became flesh. Now, I don't know how that happens, but he's God. And it happened. And he experienced all the, the, the pitfalls, all the, the negative of the world at the time was thrown at him. They, they spat on him. They, they hated him for his teachings. They whipped him. They scourged him. They crucified him. And, and the fact is, he gave up everything so that he could experience that and endure that for your sins and my sins. So he gave up everything for us. And we should never, ever, ever forget that. Did you have a comment? No, I was just going to say, I wasn't even thinking about the spiritual aspect of it. I was thinking about where he was raised. That he, he gave up the richness of being in his own town well, wander. he was he was his his uh, adopted I'm, father. I'm not saying monetarily, but it's being with your family and and comforts and and security gave it up to wander, doing his ministry, and resting wherever he. Was well, able I'll be perfectly honest with you. I understand where you're coming from with that, but I don't think this rich is, has anything. No, to do I know. With it. I'm saying that's where my mind went. Yeah, it didn't go to the fullness of the of the verse fullness of the, of the of, of creation, of the eternity. And that's what he gave up. And he gave it up for you and for me. Ten, and herein I give my advice. Now, is Paul's advice, uh, should it be taken in? Well, what do you think? He was, he was, he was a Bible scholar. He was a man that was chosen by Christ himself to basically uh, scribe most of the New Testament. So, yeah, I, I take his advice. For this is expedient for you. This is, this is important. This is going to help you along a great deal. Who have begun before, be, begun before in the ministry, took, took, uh, began before in accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. In other words, Paul's saying, look, once you become a Christian, you learn the ways, what it means to, to walk in the ways of Christ, continue to do so. Now, you say, well, why in the world would he need to say that? Because a lot of people don't. Like I said earlier, People seem to become complacent where they are. They, they, they start out with, as, as gangbusters. 
Now I can remember in, in our fir first early church days where Pastor Donna and I were building this church. Well, I had other people actually build the structure. <laughs> Me and her were, we didn't know anything really about construction, but it needed to be finished inside. And I'm balancing drywall on my head. I didn't know about those, those uh, I don't even know braces. what they're, braces that you could use to, to hold things up and to make things a lot easier. We learned along the way, uh, and then uh, putting in, um, we had an electrician, of course, put in the wiring, but uh, putting in the... Uh, um, um, wall plates and wall sockets. No, the uh, um, insulation and all that stuff. And we learned so much, but... The blessings, oh my goodness, the blessings that were flowing so freely. We had people show up with these golden uh, crushed velvet pews. They were, how long were they? About oh, 15, yeah. 20 feet long. Beautiful. Just show, do, do, you, do you need some pews? <laughs> the pulpit. Uh, the pulpit that came out of a burnt church, the only thing that survived was this pulpit. This, this, this. Ten Commandments that I have behind me uh, on, on, this, on this paper came out of another church. It's got a little scorch mark on it. It was the only thing that survived out of another church that had been burnt down to the ground. All these, a person showed up because we needed heat. He showed up and, and gave me a check to go to Home Depot to buy this heater. As a matter of fact, we still have this heater right behind us. And all these marvelous things that, and then the people. Oh, the, I remember, and this was at a flea market, and the building was donated to us, given to us, and it, it just, but you see, it's never stopped flowing, because God has always had us, given us an opportunity to continue the ministry. Now, we weren't doing YouTube back then, but now we're, we're doing that more and more each week. And uh, instead of being in a little town in Asheville, North Carolina, now we have an opportunity of the World Wide Web. What a blessing. What a blessing it is. And the, and the anointing still continues. And I don't have the time to tell you about all the blessings that just happened to my personal body this past go-around with the surgeries that I've had. That was supposed to take a long length of time, but the anointing was so powerful that it went so quickly. And yes, I'm still recuperating, but let me tell you something. Compared to, I mean, I was looking at losing my foot, you know, and now it's it's all healing. So the blessings are still flowing, and our Father still continues to allow the blessings to flow on each and every one of His children, if you trust in him if you believe in him if you do things his way and he will be quick to chastise you when you don't I can assure you from personal experience so in verse 11 now therefore perform now hear this this is what Don was just talking about a moment ago now therefore perform the doing of it that as there was a readiness to will, a want to do, an eagerness to do, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. Basically, talk is cheap. Your, your thoughts, wonderful as they are, on good things, doesn't manifest itself until you actually perform the task. We can think of all kinds of good things to do, want to do all kinds of good things, but until we perform it, we're not helping anybody. For if there, verse 12, for if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. First, you've got to be willing to want to do this, to want to do a thing, to want to help someone, to want to be there for someone else. Thirteen, for I mean not that, that other men be eased, 
and ye be burdened. I'm not. I'm not trying to get tell you this to put, place a burden on you if you're not doing anything. But remember, Paul is saying that 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 um, this is his advice to you that will be expedient for you if you're not just thinking about doing something, but you go the extra mile and you actually do something. But it's always a good thing to think about it first. Think about about what it will take to do the thing, you know. But he says in verse four. Let me read thirteen again. Going to fourteen. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burden. Fourteen. But by an equality. That now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want. In other words, you have a lot now, and they have a, a lot needed. So you can give now. And vice versa. Eventually, they may have a lot and give to you. In other words, there's an equality there. That their abundance also may be a supply for your want. That there may be equality. Another place I want to read one verse is in Acts chapter uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 34 and 35. It says this, Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them <clears throat> and brought the prices of the things that were sold, 35, and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now, preachers will use this and say, look, you need to give everything that you have. Sell it all. Give to the church. That's not what this means. But he says, well, that's what, that's what they were doing. Why were they doing it? You have to understand what was being established at that point. It was the very first church of Jesus Christ. Back in those days, there was no uh, uh, welfare, there was no uh, disability insurance, there was no insurance of any kind. Either you had money or you didn't have money. So what they did in the earliest churches, they pulled their resources together. There was an equality. There was an equality among them that they learned to possess together. So there was no want, if there was a want and need from this family over here, they provided that need. They, they helped that want. Now, has that changed today? No. But it seems to in most cases. But you've got to understand, there's a lot of other resources today that people have that they didn't have back then. They have... Uh, 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 insurance for when they get laid off. They have, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, when you're not working? Disability? No, when you're not working, uh, you get laid oh, off or something. Oh, um, I can't you, think. You know, I can't think of the word either. But it's it's when you when, when you can draw uh, unemployment, <laughs> unemployment insurance. They got welfare, they got disability, they got all these things. And they tax you. If you're working, you're taxed. Right off the top, no matter whether you pay it or not, it comes out of your check. Disability insurance and Social Security insurance and that sort of thing. But the churches today are still, yes, they take in monies. But those monies that they take in are supposed to be used to help people. And even this small little congregation, we don't get anywhere near the, the ties that we used to get. It doesn't matter. There's no need. But what we do take in, we use. It's used for something. It's used for a need. A need is a need is a need, and a need is met. And our Father has provided, and that's the point. Our Father always provides that the need is met. Um, this past uh, surgery has taken me out of. You know, I still work as a, a security, and. Um, because I don't draw a salary for, for teaching. I never have and I never will. Uh, and the Lord has blessed me with, with being able to work. Well, this, this past, these couple surgeries that I've had, I haven't been able to work. 
but Father has given us a, an availability to have a little money set aside to to see us through it in other ways and means to not not fall into any kind of debt, you know, other than than the necessities of just livelihood. But it's not really a debt that can't be paid, and it is being paid. So there's there's still no want, and He provides that, and that's what He wants you to understand. And, and and just because these people of the early churches did all these things, the church the church should never stop caring for God's children, instead of trying to make a bunch of money for themselves. And that's what a lot of people and they're paying unbelievable amount of salaries to some of these preachers. I'm talking six figure salaries is just unbelievable. Uh, what was that? I just recently heard this. This preacher got in trouble because he sold his Mercedes. Oh no, he bought a Mercedes Benz for his wife, for for a Christmas gift, and the church got all up in arms about it. Well, they should. It turned out he paid it out of his salary that he was working a job separate. From the yeah, well, I, they didn't say that at mm -hmm. first, but that's what he did. He did pay it out of his own salary. So, um, still, they 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 got on him for. It. Be that as a man. All right. As it is written in verse 15. As it is written, He that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. What does that remind you of? It reminds you of Exodus chapter 16, verse 18, about the manna. And what our Father is bringing forward to you here, you will not lack anything. If there's a need in your life, especially for the ministry, especially for, for continuing to learn and to grow, He's going to provide that for you. But there's got to be a want. There's got to be a want on your part for him, for him to be a part of your life. 16, but thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. There was a want in Titus to help you, to be there for you. 17, for indeed he, being Titus, accepted the exhortation... But being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. He did this on his own. He didn't have to be asked. And that's another thing about, about ministering. And when I say ministering, I'm not talking about being a minister. Although you are being a minister for Christ when you're doing good to others. You're actually being a minister for Christ. But the thing is, do you help people even before they ever ask you to help them? You know if there's a need or not. And I'm not saying being pushy and jump in people's lives and become a, a, a busybody. I'm talking about if you hear of a need, then go out and do. Help. Sometimes people, a lot of times people won't even ask for help. But there's a need. So help them. Just be there for them. And if they ask you why you're doing this, just say, well, you know, because there was a need. I felt in my heart that, that you needed this. 18. And we have sent with him the brother. Now this is, this. I tried to find, there's all kinds of commentaries about this brother. All kinds of different commentaries. But you know what? It doesn't matter who they think this brother is. The brother means brother or even sister in Christ. It means that, that, that this, this person was helping. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Not, not his praises is in himself or, or in other things. His praises is in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not that only, verse 19 says, and not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches. In other words, the churches themselves wanted this brother to go out and be with the apostles to help. And they chose him as well. To travel with us with this grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. So you have chosen him. He's going with us. He's helping us. And he's ministering with us. Verse 20. Avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance that which is administered by us. In other words, nobody can blame us that we're misappropriating funds or doing anything because, hey, you chose him to come with us 
And he sees everything that's going on, so everything's on the up and up. See, it's almost like a, a second witness, that there's no hanky-panky, no funny business going on. 21, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of man. So he's there to, to, to uh, keep the, the books open, where people can see and there's no funny business going on. 22, and we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. And over time they've learned. Now remember, uh, Paul got on Corinth. He got on some of these other churches of, of when they weren't following the gospel according as it is written. And they were doing things according to man's way, learning man's teachings. So he would have to get on them, but they learned from that experience. And they repented from the, uh, the evils of their ways, and they started doing what's right. So now Paul can look at them in greater light, and of course our Lord does as well. 23. Whether do any inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper. I mean, if you're, if you're helping me, it's like helping him. If you're helping him, it's like helping me concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of. They are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. That's why they're sent out, because they are the messengers. And beloved, this is what you want to be. You want to be the messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you go out there and you're helping people, and you're diligently doing good works, and you're trying to be the very best person that you can, you are an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a messenger of the churches. And finally in verse 24 to complete, Wherefore show ye to them, and before the churches, the proof of your love, and of our boasting on your behalf. In other words, show the churches, show the world the evidence of your love. And how can you do that? Are you doing something good to another person? Well, it looks like I'm out of time. Beloved, are there any questions? I want to thank you all for the opportunity of continued teaching. And I pray that these will be coming week to week once again. And um, just remember, our, our Lord wants us to be his ministers. And that doesn't necessarily mean you need to go out and you need to go to a, a cemetery, I mean a seminary and uh, learn the ways and teachings of man. You pick up the word for yourself. You study for yourself. Study to show thyself approved, not unto men, but unto God. And then you take what you learn and you do something with it. That's what all this is all about. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for your love that you have shared with us, your gospel, your good news that builds us up and shows us, Father, that you're with us every step of the way and that you want us to do good in life. You want us to help your children wherever we can. And there are so many opportunities. And I pray, dear Lord, we will never miss any of those opportunities. I pray for everyone here today and their families and all those on YouTube and their families that you watch over each and every one of us. Lead us, guide us, and direct us. And forevermore, we will give you all glory, honor, and praise. For we do love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strengths, and with all our souls. For it is in Yahshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen.